were told that uh, the Secretary General of the OAS is not going to join us for this discussion. We had confirmed with him uh, directly uh, yesterday, and uh, just 15 minutes ago, he told us that he's not going to come. In over a decade of me working at the Cato Institute and organizing these sorts of policy forums, this never happened to us before. So it looks like uh, Secretary Almagro has something more important to do uh, right now. But the show must go on, uh, so bear with me. We, we, we're sorry uh, for, for coming here. I know that many of you were expecting to hear from him. But we do have uh, uh, Maria Corina Machado uh, by video, and we have Pedro Uruchutu, who is a professor at the University, Central University of Caracas, and also a national coordinator for Vente, a political party in Venezuela. And we're going to have uh, her, uh, hear from them. Um, so let me start. Being pessimistic about Venezuela is a safe bet. What once was Latin America's richest countries has descended into chaos, dictatorship, and the worst humanitarian crisis that the world has ever witnessed outside of a war zone. Unfortunately, when people think that Venezuela has hit rock bottom, things get worse. Dislodging a dictatorship is never easy, but in the case of Venezuela, it has become a seemingly insurmountable task. For many years, while Hugo Chavez was systematically dismantling the country's democratic institutions, his regime enjoyed the enthusiastic support or silent complicity of most governments in Latin America and of the then Secretary General of the Organization of American States, Jose Miguel Insulza. Over a trillion dollars in oil revenues, the infiltration of the Venezuelan security forces by thousands of Cuban spooks, the engagement of the top brass of the military in criminal activities such as drug trafficking, smuggling, and illegal mining, and the sheer ruthlessness of the Chavista leadership have also been leading factors that explains the consolidation of a dictatorship in Caracas. But we cannot ignore the role played by the opposition. Hopelessly divided, besieged by infighting, and parts of it always willing to negotiate with a criminal narco dictatorship. However, earlier this year, a breakthrough seemed imminent. Venezuela's democratic forces finally rallied behind the charismatic leadership of Juan Guaido the president of the National Assembly. The blatant rigging of last year's presidential election led to the National Assembly declaring Guaido the interim president of Venezuela and Nicolás Maduro are an usurper. Over 50 nations representing most of the democratic world recognized the legitimacy of Guaido as the rightful leader of Venezuela. The deepening humanitarian crisis and the economic sanctions imposed by Washington all led to believe that the end was night for Maduro and his criminal dictatorship. However, weeks and months have gone by and nothing has happened. Maduro is still in power. The streets protests have waned. And Guaido and his people have agreed to a new round a new round of negotiations with the dictatorship. The opposition's unity appears once again to be fracturing. And meanwhile, thousands of Venezuelans leave the country each day as the humanitarian crisis continues to take its toll on the population. Is there anything else that the international community can do to restore democracy in Venezuela? What are the risks for regional stability of Maduro staying in power? Are negotiations with the regime unavoidable? Is it realistic to expect Maduro and his cronies to cede power democratically? 
If Luis Almagro had come today, we would have heard from him. He, unlike his predecessor, has championed the return of democracy and the end of dictatorship in Venezuela, making him one of the most effective regional leaders in memory. And once again, uh, we're sorry that he decided not to come. But we will hear from Maria Corina Machado, one of the fiercest critics of Chavismo. For many years, Maria Corina was described by international media as a radical. However, if anything, time has only proved that she was right about the criminal nature of the regime. But first, we'll hear from Professor Pedro Urrechurto, who will give us a brief explanation of how Venezuela got to this point. Pedro is a political science professor at the Universidad Central de Venezuela. He's the national coordinator for political development and education of Vente Venezuela, which is the political party led by Maria Corina Machado. He was named Latin American Program Director for the International Federation of Liberal Youth, IFURI, and in such capacities, he travels around the world, frequently raising awareness of the situation in Venezuela. Please help me welcome Pedro Urruchurto. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank Cato Institute, Juan Carlos, Ian, and all the people who made possible to have me here in this moment, of course, uh, hard moments in my country. Of course, I live there, I'm fighting there, but I'm really happy to be here in order to explain to you and to talk um, about what's going on, but what's next, and some reflections about the future of my country that, you know, uh, it's really complicated at this moment, but at the same time, we are really committed to fight um, uh, for freedom and for democracy. Uh, unfortunately, Luis Almagro cannot come, but um, definitely he's one of the key actors um, needed for, in order to understand what's going on and, of course, the role of international community. But, of course, we can try to, to, to talk about this. And, of course, Maria Corina, in her video, will explain more about, about this. But um, Venezuela has experienced six intense months of struggle, such as um, the 20 years against Chavismo and socialism. That's the truth. This, these six months has, has, have been really intense. Um, these months and the arrival to power of Juan Guaido has um, marked a turning point in the political discussion in my country. Of course, um, this became after Maduro made false elections last year, as you know. Socially and economically, the situation is overwhelming for millions of Venezuelans at this moment. According to the United Nations, more than 3.7 million Venezuelans have fled the country. A similar figure of the higher uh, of the work group of Venezuelan OAS, uh, the Venezuelan migrants group of the OAS, placed this figure at 4 million at this moment. That means that around 5,000 people are living from through the, our borders per day. It's like two, 200 people per hour that, is living, that are living in our country at this moment. So this figure could increase to 7 million in the next year with this context. Um, of course, this not mentioning the humanitarian and the humanitarian crisis that my country is suffering at this moment. And I have to say that today all Venezuelans are aware not only about the urgency of uh, the change, but also we are really aware and conscious that the failure of President Guaido as interim president is the failure of all our country. So yes, it's important to support him. We are supporting him in this important fight, but um, it has to be in a determined way uh, without distractions, like as you mentioned, Juan Carlos, about dialogues and talks that I will explain this briefly in a few minutes, but at the end, the regime used this just for gain time. So um, we don't need more distractions, and definitely uh, we really need um, a strategy that leads to the defeat of the Venezuelan regime, criminal regime. That is important mention that we need to, to, to have to do here. So this regime, Maduro's regime, 
for the fifth time since 2013 when Maduro took office, used dialogue and talks in order to gain time and to make people believe that a political solution with them in power is possible. Every time these conversations take place, not only are focused um, more into how Maduro could stay in power, but not the real solutions and the real um, way to, you know, to make a change and to, to achieve a change in the country. So um, the position of Guaido, we have to say that this moment in Barbados, where it's taking place these conversations, is, uh, yes, we can see it's weakened. Much more when there's not an element of pressure that caused you know, the negotiation to lead a credible exit from the regime. So they only use these conversations in order to get one more year or six months more, but not more than that. So time favors the regime. For example, next week in Caracas will take place um, the meeting of Foro de Sao Paulo. And of course, they have the clear intention to rearrange itself into the political dynamics in Latin America. But also, Iran's foreign minister will visit Venezuela, Bolivia, and Nicaragua as well next week. So they deploy forces, many of them criminal and anti-Western forces, are just, you, you can see how they are gaining ground, and that is why an unconventional solution is urgently needed, because the thing is that we are not facing a conventional dictatorship. So I want to share with you three remarks that maybe could uh, give an idea about our visions and our thoughts on uh, what's going on and what's next about the solution in Venezuela. The first thing is that we are not dealing, we're not dealing with politicians, but with criminals. And I think this is the, the, the key um, reflection that we need to, to understand. And criminals, they are criminals that are linked to international crime. So this makes the solution unconventional. And we need to understand that the defeat of this group merits determined efforts by the international community, in particular from the Western Hemisphere. That's the first reflection and talk that I want to share with you. The second is that the Venezuelan solution is not about what is um, desirable, but what is possible at this moment. Um, we will all like, of course, an election tomorrow in order to solve this crisis. But the thing is that, uh, the Venezuelan problem only could be solved with a credible threat that allows, finally, a negotiation for the surrender of power of the regime. And is that what can make them yield? So for that reason, force is essential, but not, I, 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 I don't like to talk about intervention or invasion. That is a common discussion right now about, about the situation in Venezuela, because we are already intervened and invaded by Russians, Cubans, um, Turkish, etc. So we are talking to use the force in order to create a credible threat as a pressure element. So, you know, give incentives, real incentives to Maduro to leave power. Um, the third reflection that I want to share with you is that there can be no free election in Venezuela if Maduro is still in power. So it's essential to defeat the criminals and then we can think in the political solution. To pretend any talk in which Maduro wants to call for elections without them being organized in a transitional scheme means that there will never be free elections because at the end, there cannot be free choice while the regime controls the intelligence and torture corps or the media or illicit and illicit money and part of the armed forces. So the transition must be broad in the ideological, but we need to be really, really firm in the ethical to prevent corruption and impunity that are imposed. So I definitely don't think that today all the options are on the table. Uh, there are some discarded, and inevitably, the facts are leading to the only possible courage. So it is time definitely to def defeat socialism, corruption, and the criminals who ruined Venezuela to then give way to the Venezuelan of freedom for which we are fighting day by day in our country. So this is my, this is my, my main thoughts that I want to share with you in this first part. I, I would like to, to uh, have Maria Corina with the video and her reflections, but definitely we are committed to freedom and democracy, but we need to understand that we are not facing politicians. We are facing criminals. And if we don't have the right characterization of this regime would be really hard to defeat it in the way that we need to do it. So thank you.
Thank you, Pedro. We're definitely going to hear more from you <laughs> later. Uh, now let's hear from Maria Corina Machado. Maria Corina Machado, as many of you know, has been banned from leaving Venezuela for over five years. She has been at Cato before as a speaker. We would have loved to have her again, but unfortunately that's not possible. Uh, the plan originally was to have her via Skype. However, uh, as you might imagine, uh, internet connection is not reliable in Venezuela. We run some tests uh, yesterday in the afternoon, and it seemed that it wasn't going to be possible to have a decent uh, connection with her uh, via Skype. So she kindly sent us uh, her remarks by video, and we're going to run that right now. Uh, just to introduce her, Maria Corina Machado. She's the national coordinator of the opposition political party, Vente Venezuela. She represented the state of Miranda in the National Assembly of Venezuela from 2010 to 2014, when she was illegally removed from office by the Maduro regime. She also ran as an independent presidential candidate in the opposition primaries held in February 2012. Previously, she confounded and was chairman of SUMATE, Venezuela's leading watchdog for electoral transparency and promoter of civil liberties and political rights. Let's hear from Maria Corina Machado. Greetings to all from Caracas, Venezuela. I am very grateful to the Cato Institute for this opportunity, Juan Carlos Hidalgo and Ian Vasquez, and I'm honored to share this panel with the Secretary General of the OAS, Luis Almagro, as well as my fellow member of Vente Venezuela, Pedro Ruchurtu. Venezuela is facing today an existential crossroads. Either we move forward in the route and the path of strength and courage that we've worked in these last months, or we can fall once again in this trap created by the Maduro regime of the so-called dialogues and farce elections. The Venezuelan criminal state has unleashed an unconventional conflict uh, in coalition with terrorist groups such as the ELN, the FARC, Hezbollah, Hamas, drug cartels, and the Cuban tyranny. And they will not let go Venezuelan territory, resources, and institutions unless they are confronted with a stronger liberating force of those democratic actors in the region that understand what's at stake. The consequences of Maduro staying in power, and the regime staying in power, are devastating. Just imagine what can happen in Venezuela in six months, or what could happen to Colombia at the end of this year. Certainly, this uh, systematically created exodus of millions of Venezuelans has strong consequences in for our neighboring countries. But, but not all are obvious, because the regime has managed to infiltrate some of these groups of migrants with what they call social movements, which are individuals whose objective is to destabilize these democracies in our, in our region. At the same time, we realize what it means, the increasing involvement of Russia and Iran using Venezuela as a hub for intelligence uh, activities and how these constitute an imminent threat for the national security of the United States. So what's next? First, first of all, we need to have a common and, and real characterization of the true nature of the re regime we're facing. This is not a conventional dictatorship. If it were, it would have fallen a long time ago. We are facing a criminal state. And the efficient option to have regime change is through the use of unconventional force in a comprehensive offensive. This should start with the, the, the creation of a coalition of our closest allies, those that suffer the most of Venezuelan tragedy. These are Colombia, Brazil, the Netherlands Antilles, 
and the United States of America. The objective is to build a credible threat, an imminent and severe threat that has high costs for the regime and its global partners. And this should be done uh, with the use of intelligence, resources, diplomacy, uh, information and communications, uh, international justice, police actions, and specific military activities. The first objective is to dismantle the repression uh, of an intelligence apparatus of the regime, which is today its main source of support. Once this is done, we can move ahead in, ahead in coercive and specific actions done with chirurgical precision. This will show the regime that the strength of the liberating forces are certainly bigger, stronger, higher, and most effective of those of the mafia system that keeps them together. There are several myths that the regime has been putting into and, and setting into the um, international public opinion uh, within their narrative. The objective of this myth is, myths is to inhibit the mostly required international action and support needed to produce regime change. First, uh, the regime insists in saying that we are demanding an international invasion. This is the 21st century. I've already mentioned the nature of this conflict, this unconventional war. It is obvious that what we require is the application of strength in those joints in those, in those points that are critical for the support of the regime in the framework of the responsibility to protect and stop the genocide that's taking place in Venezuela today. Another myth refers to uh, the idea that getting international support for the liberation of Venezuela will produce a civil war. This is absolutely false. In Venezuela, there are not cultural, ideological, ethnical, religious, or regional tensions among our citizens. On the contrary, Venezuela is a society that is together, it's close together, cohesive, and uh, overwhelmingly demands the departure of the regime immediately. And finally, another myth refers to the, uh, the fact that in order to have a peaceful transition, members of the mafia should be part of that government. This is not only uh, in unacceptable from an ethical perspective, but would be a huge political error. Because that would mean that Venezuela would turn and consolidate into a mafia state. And we just have to see the history of Nicaragua to understand it, its consequences. That's why today must realize that our objective goes beyond the departure of Maduro or even dismantling the regime that is in power in Venezuela. We need to stop and get rid of the uh, anti-Western uh, criminal terrorist and narco-trafficking forces that have created this revolution, this system, this model that is using our nation to expand and destabilize the whole hemisphere. We Venezuelans are committed to do what it takes, but we need the international support and we need it now. This is our hugest, our biggest um, opportunity and in our nation's and our Republican history. But it is also the biggest threat this hemisphere has faced. There is only one option to move ahead, 
there is only one option, victory. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Maria Corina, uh, for that powerful <laughs> message. Uh, given that we, don't, we won't have uh, Luis Almagro joining us, I'm going to step aside from my role as a moderator. I'm going to be giving a lot of some of my uh, points of views yeah. uh, regarding what we just heard from Maria Corina and from Pedro. Uh, certainly, um, you can sense the degree of desperation that is taking hold uh, among members of the democratic uh, forces in Venezuela. Uh, the situation uh, keeps deteriorating, and uh, the hope that uh, at some point uh, people had in the beginning of, of, of the year that the regime was going to crack certainly uh, didn't take place. But perhaps the biggest disappointment that I perceive uh, from here is that the opposition is once again fracturing. Uh, you can sense from, from Pedro's and Maria Corina's words that, that they don't approve of the decision of Juan Guaido to uh, join talks with representatives of the regime in Barbados. And the reasons are pretty obvious. As I mentioned earlier, if, any, if anything, Maria Corina has been proven right repeatedly throughout the years about the criminal nature of uh, the Chavista dictatorship. There is for sure no way to envision a scenario where Maduro will willingly give power in a democratic way. But the question is, is there an alternative? Because I hear from uh, friends in the opposition in Venezuela that claim that even though in a scenario where uh, Maduro and his cronies will be expelled from power is the most desirable outcome, that certainly is not happening. Survivor mood is setting in in Venezuela. People are more concerned with finding food, medicine, or leaving the country than with toppling the regime. Uh, so it looks like we cannot count on a turn of events of Venezuelans taking into the streets and forcing the regime out. Thus, uh, as I understand from, from Maria Corina and from Pedro, they claim that this can only happen with external pressure. Now, Pedro, I see that you and Maria Corina are very diplomatic <laughs> in not um, describing exactly how this international pressure will materialize because there's already international pressure. We're talking about uh, economic sanctions from Washington. We're talking about sanctions on individuals uh, from the regime, that they are banned from visiting other countries, uh, holding assets, uh, making financial transactions. Um, it is true, and uh, as... Uh, People who are not enthusiastic about economic sanctions, as we are here at Cato Institute, we have long opposed economic sanctions on countries because we perceive that they're not um, effective and that they, they end up punishing the people. If there was an, a case for economic sanctions against PDVSA and against the uh, Venezuelan economy at large, was because things will unfold very rapidly and the pain was going to be short uh, on the Venezuelan people, but that doesn't look like it's going to be the case. My question then, it will be like, what kind of pressure, besides the one that already exists, uh, is it that you and, and, and your political party and Maria Corina Machado envision? I think this is, uh, can you hear me? It's working, I think, I think yes, yeah. okay. Well, thank you for your question. It's really important. Yes, you say that we are really diplomatic, but of course, uh, when we live there, we need to, you know, take care of our words. 
um, in order to uh, do this work uh, with key actors privately, of course. Um, but yes, when we talk about more international pressure, we refer into um, we need to to deal with this problem as the problem that is that is a criminal problem. So we see that most of the international pressure, of course, needed and important, um, has been applied more more like into a political perspective. But we need to understand that we, we need to go to a criminal perspective in this way. So as Maria Corinne explained in the video, it's important to use more effectively, for example, intelligence information. Uh, it's not a secret that in Venezuela there are camps of Hezbollah, Hamas, ELN, or Cartel de Sinaloa, for example, operating and working. So we can see how 70% of our territory at this moment, directly or indirectly, um, is controlled by these irregular groups. So we think that with more intelligence information, with more police actions or police, police pressure, international justice actions, I think we could press even more in this way. But of course, we need to understand, because I have to say that, you know, uh, it was like a, an attempt to provoke a break in the Venezuela military. That was the main strategy in the, the last three months. Um, and definitely, um, it was, you know, thought like a starting point for Maduro's exit. But the thing is that uh, this, this strategy has proven that it's unfeasible um, because the military are precisely those who benefit the most from the, exis the existing criminal movement at this moment. So, so they are part of the, of the system. So you cannot try to, you know, to break this military when they are part of the, of the system. So, um, for example, the lucrative sectors of food and, er and energy imports is controlled and exploited by the military uh, brass. So it's really complicated at, at this moment. So one, from one to 10, yeah. if you have to uh, put a number yeah. on the likelihood of the military um, turning on, on, on Maduro. Yeah. What, what is it? You need to differentiate between the military leadership and of course the, you know, the troops, et cetera. But the is leadership it, that at the end is that support them in the power because they are part of the mafias, uh, they are a, minor, a minority. The problem, the, yeah, but the problem is that the troops are being closely watched by Cuban That's, it, that's uh, the spies. thing, so that's not possible to, to get a break into the, the military at this moment because they are infiltrated by Cubans. So uh, the, only way, the only way to do that, it will be then for the leadership of the military to turn on Maduro. And you say that that's one out of 10. Yeah, of course. Or maybe three or two, no more than that at this moment. So for that reason, we need to create the incentives in this moment in order to do more than that, because at the end, it has failed in during the, the... Now, in, in late, late April, we had uh, yeah. the case of, of, of uh, that is skirmishes in the streets of, of Caracas and, yeah. and Juan Guaido calling for the ultimate, uh, the last yeah. um, push against the regime, and that failed. Would you call it a failure? Well, I think when you try to get a transition with the mafias, uh, the result is that that happened that day. I mean, that day, what was uh, on the ground was, okay, we changed Guaido, uh, Maduro for Guaido, was the new, the new leader of, of the government. But, you know, uh, Padrino Lopez, who is the Minister of Defense, and Michael Moreno, who is the president of the uh, illegitimate uh, Court is a justice court, um, stay in power. So at the end, that that at the end, that was not a transition at all. So the thing is that if you if you don't see this transition process like, um, I mean, ethical transition, and as a, of course it could be open to ideolo ideologically open, but if you don't understand that you need an ethic dimension of this transition. Um, will happen what happened on uh, April 30. Now, so let me be devil's advocate, and I'm grilling you here, yeah. uh, and I'm going to grill. Yeah. Maria Corina used to be uh, presented as part of the group of the radicals of in the Venezuelan opposition, whereas uh, Capriles and others were the sensible ones. Uh, Leopoldo Lopez, Antonio Ledesma, and Maria Corina Machado were the radicals, the, one, the ones that didn't want to engage in negotiations and, and so on. 
Uh, Juan Guaidó is a disciple of Leopoldo Lopez. Uh, they're, they're close. Uh, we remember that. The same party, et cetera. The same yeah. party. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, one of the first uh, images of that day, in, in of the, the day of the final push, the alleged uh, final push against the Thirsty was uh, Leopoldo Lopez by the side of, of Juan Guaidó uh, without being in his home arrest. The fact that Guaidó is engaging in talks with the regime does it mean that, that uh, his political party uh, and, and Leopoldo Lopez are no longer uh, among the group of radicals, if we can say it, are, are willing to, uh, they have come to the realization that there is no way to dislodge the regime but to engage in talks? Well, I think, you know, maybe they, they are trying to are uh, in all the, op the possible options that they could try. But the thing is that the time has demonstrated that um, these conversations uh, don't work at all. So, of course, we need to understand that um, I think there is another way to be or to do politics in Venezuela that not be radical. I mean, when you see people, this, this is about people suffering. This is about people that are, you know, are dying because there's no food, there's no medicine. People are you know, fleeing through the border. So be radical is more like an attack that, that we have, but at the end, it's the only option possible in way to, to, you know, to, to, to face this regime. I mean, all the time demonstrated that, that we have, uh, you say that at, at the beginning of this session, that we had right in the, in the you know, characterization of this regime. We, we were the first that talk about dictatorship, for example, and people go, oh, you're exaggerated. It's exaggerated. Of course, that's not possible. This is not a dictatorship. We talk about um, humanitarian crisis, and people say, oh, come on, this is Venezuela. It's not possible because, because you have oil and you're a rich country. But at the end, you can see how uh, the situation is even worse than that we imagine in that moment. So this, of course, is a way, an easy way to tag people in order to say, okay, you are radicals and you are not into politics. But the thing is that we understand that we are, no, we are not facing uh, politicians at this moment. So we need to understand that the political solution, of course, we want a political solution. Um, and of course, this political solution will come. But the first thing is to defeat these guys. These bad guys, because they, we are a kidnapped country. That's 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 the the, the truth. It's, it's not a, a, I mean, maybe the common dictatorship. Uh, probably this uh, dictator uh, could live power in others in in other contexts, but this, this is not the context at all. So, yes, I think uh, as Maria Corina said in the video, and as I say in my words, in my words, this is about understand the, the fact that we need to, 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 to have in this, in this context. Now, um, we're not talking about the possibility of uh, US military intervention. Yeah. You know that there is no appetite whatsoever among public opinion or Congress to approve such a thing, right? Uh, so let's, just to be clear, that's not something that, that Maria Corina or, or or your political party is supporting right now, right? Well, we have, I think, internally in Venezuela, we have tools in order to, to push on this. Um, as I explained, we don't talk about intervention or invasion because we are already <laughs> intervened and invaded. But the thing is that, for example, constitutionally, we have elements and tools in order to, um, to press and to push on this, on this way, of course. Uh, 187 art article in the Constitution, for example, it could be. But it's not for uh, calling for a military intervention. I mean, it's, it's calling for, yes, a coalition, international coalition, in order to create a credible threat, but using, you know, all the possible elements that our neighbors, for example, have, Colombia, Brazil, even allies like Israel, for example. But the thing is that we need to, you know, to talk about the tools available in order to create this, this pressure with, as I, as I said before, intelligence, military, uh, financial, of course, even diplomacy, of course. But the thing is that uh, we, we have internally this element, but also we have externally the element, for example, the R2P responsibility to protect that is part of the strategy that I think um, could be 
effective in order to press because it's not only about the regime, it's about people suffering. So if you are conscious of, of all this, um, we believe the international community maybe uh, need to get more involved in that, in that way. What's the point then of the National Assembly approving Venezuela joining the TR, the, yeah. uh, the Inter-American uh, Treaty for Mutual Defense? It yeah. sounds like that's a step towards inviting a military force to uh, liberate Venezuela, no? Yes, well, we are, of course, we as a political party, we are uh, pushing on this. Um, there was a first discussion of this, of this, um, um, this topic. Um, probably next week will be the second discussion and the final discussion in order to approve this, uh, this topic. But yes, of course, it's, it's uh, important in order to add pressure. But I have to say that we have 20, 20 weeks uh, pushing for this. So you can see how, at the end, of course, it's important because the public opinion, I mean, this is important to understand. Um, if we are facing a non-conventional conflict, we need to understand that public opinion is really important. And public opinion, at least in Venezuela, understands the urgency that of, of, of finding a solution at this, at this moment. We are not saying that these are you know, magical solutions that just approving uh, an article or just approving uh, an agree or whatever, it could be uh, enough in order to, to create this, this pressure, but of course it helps. And it's important in order to make this um, credible threat because if you go to a negotiation table with different elements and with the support of 50 countries that are recognizing you as a, as a, as a legitimate president, Come on, you can use these these allies, these international allies, in order to make um, and to and to tell uh, this regime that you are serious on this and you are the president. Because the thing is that these these talks in Oslo, in Barbados, etc., um, the the start point is that Maduro is president and he's he's not president. The thing is that the real president is Juan Guaido, so he has the power constitutionally, because Maduro. Of course, uh, um, made a fraud in, in last year, so he's not president. But your party is not nice. supporting the talks. Of course not, because no. the thing is, but I have to say, we are not uh, supporting these talks as the as the, the in the past, because at the end, it's about the moment. Of course, we know that we need a negotiation in order to um, find a solution. But the thing is, uh, is um, nego the negotiation in order to uh, make this regime, you know, all the incentives for lift power, not for maintaining power. Are so you that's, having... the, that's the main thing. So, of course, we know that dialogue and negotiation is an important part of politics, but the thing is that this is not the moment for that. Because are you having are... doubts about the leadership of Juan Guaido and his strategy? I don't think so. We are really support, support him since the beginning. We think that the, the path of courage in, in January, that, you know, when we apply the, this article 233 and all the, the constitutional ways that in the way he took office in, in, that, in that way. Um, but the only claim that we have in that way is that, and, and the call that, we, that we, we, we do to him, we make to him, is in order to uh, continue in that courage path. I think yeah. you have the support of the most important um, allies in the world, the Western Hemisphere, you have the popular support from people. You have an international and, and, and institutional support from the National Assembly. So you have the, all the tools possible in order to um, make this, this uh, opportunity, that this is a small opportunity, of course, um, a, a real achievement. So definitely, um, of course, as I said in my, in my, in my first uh, uh, words, that the failure of Guaido is a failure of all Venezuelans. And definitely we trust that he ha he's the leader at this moment, but of course we need, um, we need a determined way in that, in that moment. Two final questions and then we will open up to, to yeah. the public. Um, you're, in, you're in Venezuela, right? You're based in Venezuela. The, did you perceive that, that the leaders of the regime are feeling the pinch somehow from sanctions? both national on the economy, but also like particularly the, the, particularly the individual sanctions yes. uh, uh, against their bank accounts, against their family members and so on. Do you feel that at least some members of the regime maybe are having second doubts? I think yes, and that's a way that they have found, you know, uh, 
different ways in order to, to have transactions. For example, for example, with gold or with minerals or different ways. Of course, with links with Turkey, for example. And they are, they are looking for that. But of course, these sanctions uh, have affected them, definitely. Um, but I think it's not enough. They need to be more, uh, more effective, and even uh, more members of, 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 the, of, the, of the government. There are rumors that uh, Chavismo is cracking yeah. in these negotiations in Barbados. Uh, people claim that some members of, of, the, of the regime yeah. are uh, seriously contemplating the idea of, of turning on Maduro. And as long as they are allowed to participate yeah. in elections uh, against uh, the opposition, what, what, what do you think? Well, if you, if you understand that it's a mafia state and there are several groups, of course, not all the groups are represented in Barbados. So that's normal to understand that some groups feel excluded of that negotiations. So, of course, I think, um, and, and definitely I think that for that reason, these conversations, uh, these talks um, uh, will fail. Because at the end, this is a, a mafia state. This is not, it's not a cohesionated government or, or group. You're 100% certain they will fail? I think 99%. No, that's a pretty <laughs> safe bet. Well, thank you, Pedro. Uh, thank we're going to gonna, uh, open up to to questions from the audience. So once again, uh, we apologize for not having Luis Almagro. We would have loved to hear his take on what his uh, perception of what the continent should do next in order to, yep. to put pressure on, on, on Maduro and, and his criminal regime. Uh, do we have uh, mics already? Let's start with the gentleman here. Please wait for the microphone, introduce yourself, and ask a question, not make a statement or a speech. Thank you for a wonderful session, and Dr. Professor Pedro was fabulous. I can't pronounce your last name, but you're Me Basque. neither. Ah, so Pedro, it's okay. <laughs> you're a Basque, and Basque are tough guys. Uh, they know how to take on Francisco Franco. Uh, I disagree with you 100% on some. I am absolutely delighted that the Secretary General is not here. He's probably scared of you guys. He doesn't want to have to deal with that because I go listen to him forever. He's a great statesman, but he talks about democracy, dialogue, uh, non-military, peaceful things. How wonderful, music in the background. I spent 30 years in the State Department, all in the last century, and all dictatorships, and you don't move criminals or dictators with cello players lady poets, and nice people in suits like ours. You do it with people who know how to f forward lean and cause trouble. So my question is, are you, with this important uh, position you're well articulating and with that wonderful lady, are you making sure that not only all the important people that are here, like my friend here who's my age, but people on Capitol Hill, People at the National Security Council, are you making sure that people get this important message of the new way to go after criminals and not that wonderful stuff that our wonderful friend, the Secretary General, shovels about once a week? Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, do you perceive a change from the US authorities? I think yes. I think yes, but But maybe. a change from the enthusiasm that the Trump administration showed at the beginning of the I year. I think maybe you can, uh, and it's normal to feel maybe confused with a lot of information, you know, that is coming. And of course, we, when you don't have a coherent strategy and a coherent, you know, um, way um, in, to, to address this situation, of course, uh, you can confuse. But uh, I mean, to key, key actors uh, or um, decision makers, I mean. But um, at the same time, I think that uh, United States is aware of all the nature of this regime. They know, they have the information, they know what is a criminal uh, dynamic in the country. And of course, they know that um, they need to, I mean, to influence and to act urgently because it's the future of the hemisphere. I have to say that the future of our region um, is, uh, you know, this, the defense of, of the Western hemisphere principles and the, um, are in risk. 
when you see Iranians, when you see all these people in, in the country, Hezbollah, etc. So it's a, a security threat, of course, and I think they are really aware of, of this. But of course, we need a coherent uh, strategy on this. Um, and of course, we understand that not all the the, the, the decision makers are you know are um, in the in the same way maybe because they, they could think differently. They, that depends on the agency, etc. But at the end, they know that Venezuela is a, at this moment is a, a threat for for the security of the United States and the, of all the hemispheres. So. Uh, Maybe yes, some confusion, but I don't think that uh, there is a change into the uh, the energy to, in yeah. order to support Guaido and all fight. Well, I don't feel much in the mood of defending Luis Almagro right now, but I have to say yeah. that he has been a fresh and welcome uh, departure from the uh, at least the tone that the Organization of American States had under uh, the previous Secretary General. Uh, in Sulsa, who mm. uh, at the very best <laughs> yeah. was uh, like, you know, not very uh, helpful in dealing uh, with the Venezuelan crisis, friends, yeah. but his silence uh, was uh, deafening uh, when it came to to, uh, to the way that uh, back then uh, Chavez and then Maduro was dismantling the uh, democratic institutions. Uh, now, this is a forum on Venezuela. We're not going to talk about other countries, but uh, I'm going to use the opportunity also to say that it's mind-boggling that uh, Almagro is not as assertive when it comes to Evo Morales in Bolivia, yeah. or even uh, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua, as he is with, uh, in Venezuela. But uh, we might have another forum with an empty chair to discuss that. Uh, any other questions? The friend with the uh, Cardinals. Jersey, over there. Yeah, hello. Um, right now, the United States is in an election year. Uh, the European Union is actually aware with some domestic problems. Colombia has its problems of its own, and Brazil is in, in the middle of a corruption scandal. These countries have a really big domestic problems of their own. What makes you think Venezuela will become the top priority or their own domestic problems, and that they will take on the responsibilities of having an intervention. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you for your question. And precisely is that this is why it's important um, to influence and to act urgently because at the end, you know, all these countries have their own problems. And of course, if they feel like um, the situation in Venezuela is normalizing, but it's not true, of course they could distract or even if they don't see a, a, a you know, um, coherent strategy, of course, they could feel like, okay, there's nothing to do. But I feel that there is a real commitment from these countries at this moment, but that depends on us and the leadership of all the people that, you know, need to push into the Venezuelan solution in order to maintain this, um, this topic and this conflict uh, as a top priority. I think to the, today uh, is a priority, but of course, it, if it could change if we don't do the, the right things, I think. So... Um, I think we have an opportunity. We have a, uh, it's not, of, of course, a, a eternal opportunity, but I, I think we need to take advantage of that. The gentleman over there. Could you discuss if there's a role, if any, for the IMF, World Bank, IFC, IDB, how those organizations might be able to finance the exit or the alleviation of financial capital invested by um, China, uh, uh, Putin, and so forth. Yes, well, when we talk about these uh, organizations, of course, we are conscious about China and their interests that they have in Venezuela. You know, the debt is huge. It's around six, sixty thousand million dollars or more than that. But um, definitely, I have to say that um, on that way, uh, one of the main strategies of this process, you know, this change process with the interim president, etc., was to create the conditions in order to then, after after you know the defeat of this regime, to negotiate and to talk about what's the best the best way in order to to. To think about this, but at the at the end, all depends on the defeat of the regime. I mean, 
it not make sense trying to discuss about this at this moment or trying to think on, on how to deal with these organizations, et cetera. Yes, of course, but I mean, at, at the end, China uh, is, they're looking for money or for, for their, their business. And of course, I think they will support uh, a political transition. But the thing, for example, I think it's more, are more important Cubans at this moment and the, their political influence in terms of, you know, all the, um, you know, not only about armed forces, but I mean, if you go, to, I, I always uh, say, this, say this, but if you go, for example, to Venezuela and try to get a new passport, when you go to the office of the identity office, um, the, the people who is there, they're Cubans, for example. So you can see how is the influence that we have. So, of course, um, I think the, the problem with China, even with Russia, that I have to say, Venezuela, uh, yes, probably they could have interest, but there's not their natural uh, geographical uh, influence area. But the thing is that um, I think we need to, in a first hand, we need to, to address this situation from the really key political uh, actors. And of course, I think China is um, in backstage. They are supporting in a certain way these talks and because they are looking to save their businesses. That's, that's the thing. So, um, yeah, but I think that the priority at the end is, is to, to, to deal with the political key actors. And of course, China, I think, will be an important actor. But I mean, they only are looking for their businesses and not, not uh, yeah, I think. My name is Per. Yes. Yeah. My name is Per Kurovsky. Uh, this question goes to Juan Carlos Hidalgo. <laughs> I read here in one of the paper the last phrase says the real culprit of Venezuela's plight is socialism. 1829, Simon Bolivar imposed on Venezuela the Spanish mining ordinances that placed all the oil resources, everything on the earth, in the hands of the state. That meant, in some years during the Steel regime, that over 97% of all the export revenues of the country went directly to the government. That's not socialism. That's something completely different. Uh, socialism in that way would be perhaps sharing out the oil revenues. But that concentration of wealth in the state is really not socialism. And I wonder if always picking on socialism does not make it worse. Because when I see it in Europe, and I know many of them in Europe, 90% of the leaders in Europe, they all have in their closet a little old T-shirt with Che Guevara symbols and things like that. So it goes back and back. And had it not been for the miraculous, I would say, support of Canada to all this debate, we wouldn't have gotten a fraction of the support around the world because that was a nation with such credibility that was able to penetrate this mentality that is around the world. So is it not time we stop talking about socialism in Venezuela and calling it the real things, the oil revenue curse? No, well, I, I disagree. I remembered last time I went to uh, Venezuela, which was like three years ago, yeah. no, really, 15, 2016. 2016, yeah. Uh, I went to 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 a small meeting of people, and they asked me. Uh, they asked me, "What should we make of this? Uh, what should the lesson be of the situation we're we're in?" And I said something like, "Well, there's, there are three big lessons here." Uh, First of all, or things that you need to do in order to not to repeat the mistake. And I remember saying, I don't want to be here in 20 years warning Venezuelans against about the dangers of socialism and all that. Oil certainly is a fundamental question for the future of democracy in Venezuela. And right now we're working on a paper that we hope to publish in a few months that goes precisely to answer that question. And it starts with that ordinance by, by Bolivar uh, regarding uh, the mining code, as it, as it was called. Uh, but certainly, the case of Venezuela is atypical mm. in the sense that, let's remember the, 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 the maxim of Margaret Thatcher, uh, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. But in the case of Venezuela, 
it wasn't other people's money. The money was kind of literally flowing from, from the ground. Over a trillion dollars flew into the coffers, went into the coffers of, of, of Chavez while he was in power. Trillion dollars. That's, I, may, I remember I made the calcul calculation. It's like seven times the uh, pl uh, Marshall Plan. That allowed the regime to destroy the economy with socialist policies and not feel the pinch immediately. Expropriations, nationalizations, uh, increasingly, uh, increasing the, 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 the payroll of the government, uh, enormous social programs uh, that didn't have any, um, any other purpose than creating dependency among the population. So we have to name these policies by their name. That's socialism. Yeah. Uh, we know what socialism looks like, and that's what they have been sure. implementing in Venezuela for a while. Uh, and now, let's, let's be honest. We publish at the Cato Institute, uh, we co-publish uh, Economic Freedom Index, uh, where the authors of, the, of this index uh, measure economic policies and legal policies according to the principles of economic freedom, small government, sound money, protection of property rights, uh, regulations, uh, international trade, and so on. The demise of Venezuela, according to this index, and this is not my opinion, this is an objective measurement of economic freedom. The demise of Venezuela didn't start in 1998, started in 1976 with the nationalization of oil. But we can even go further back. I mean, uh, the previous presidents from Carlos Andres Perez engaged in populism, engaged in status uh, policies, economic policies, exchange controls, and, and clientelism, and, and so on. The Saudi Venezuela. The Saudi Venezuela, let's, uh, let's remember. Yeah. In 1983, a leading scholar of, of Venezuela, Carlos Rangel, wrote a, uh, uh, gave a speech to the Chamber of, of Commerce, I think it was back then, where he said that the problem of Venezuela was socialism and oil. And that was in 1983. Uh, so we can see in the Economic Freedom Index that the grade of Venezuela, the score of Venezuela on economic freedom started diminishing from the late 1970s. Then there was a mild um, upturn in the early 1990s when Carlos Andres Perez again came back and, and facing a difficult economic uh, situation, uh, implemented some reforms by the IMF, but it was too late and Chavez led the coup and then you have uh, Chavismo came in, coming to power. But since 1988, we see that that decline has uh, steepened. So yeah, I think that it's not only necessary, but our duty to call things by their name. This is socialism. And I hope that people in Venezuela have it clear so they don't repeat the same mistake. And I hope people outside Venezuela have it clear, even here in the United States, where socialism is becoming popular among certain uh, political uh, actors. Um, <laughs> let me see. We have him, and we can go back if, uh, just in case. Uh, Gabriel Greenspan from the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Uh, how has cryptocurrency been used by opponents of Maduro to fund the opposition and minimize suffering in Venezuela? Well, uh, as a consequence of the economic crisis, you can see um, this is a, a new way to, to get funding. But the curious thing is not about the opposition, but about the regime. They, are cre they created like a cryptocurrency that is not that, of course. Uh, this is a Petro. Uh, the Petro is the, you know, um, the support is the uh, oil, of course, and it depends on the oil prices. Um, in order to, you know, to get access to this world of cryptocurrency um, as a part of their illegal activities. So, of course, they are getting uh, money and they are trading through these, um, these platforms in order to, you know, launch money. And, yes, but that's, that's um, they're using technology. That's the thing. We are facing, you know, this is a, like... Um, hybrid regime because they use, of course, totalitarian practices, but of course they use technology in order to, uh, you know, um, try to 
um, overcome these sanctions and all the dynamic, the economical uh, dynamic that we are facing. But but yes, uh, for ex this uh, this is an example of the the things that they are doing. For example, with cryptocurrency, no. Pedro, why is it that the regime hasn't arrested Maria Corina or Juan Guaidó? Yeah, I think because they have international support. I think because um, at the end, the cost of doing that is really high. What cost? Well, the cost, for, I think, for international community and, and for, for then, of course, in order to, you know, the more prominent leaders in the position. And of course, I think they, they have used the fear. For, for example, about Maria Corina, I have to say, um, they don't need to, to put her in jail. I mean, she cannot leave the country. Uh, she is, you know, uh, she cannot participate in elections. Of course, there's not election in Venezuela, but <laughs> she, she cannot do that. Um, even if she wants to travel in the country, uh, she cannot uh, go, for example, by plane because it's prohibited to the companies to sell tickets to her. So uh, she needs to go by car. So maybe if you take one hour by plane, she needs to travel 12 hours in order to get a, to go to a different city. So I think the, the, this kind of regime is trying to use um, different ways to persecute opposition. Of course, one, many leaders are in jail, other are persecuted, other are, you know, they use different ways in order to persecute opposition. But at the end, uh, nobody is free in Venezuela at all. So that's it, that's the truth. Gentlemen over here, wait for the mic, please. John Osler, um, it's, we've been going for 40 minutes and we haven't discussed the immediate crisis in Venezuela. Humanitarian aid, that's what's needed. Yeah. Seven million, you said, are gonna eventually leave. We're gonna have another Syria caused by the Russians. What are we doing about it? Trump, a, a month ago, was willing, he's, he sent aid to the borders of of Venezuela, I don't know if you knew that. But there it sits. And you got to get to the OEA, to the United Nations with your message, we've got a humanitarian crisis and we're not gonna solve the bankruptcy problem in Venezuela until we get people staying home. And Trump would go along with that because he wants Emigrate, emigration to stop. If we don't act like civil people and give and, and look at what the problem is, it's humanitarianism, what are you doing about it? Thank you. Uh, there was some um, aid coming from the yeah. Red Cross that was reported, the International Red Cross yeah. uh, supposedly reached an agreement with the regime so aid will come in. Uh, what's, what's the date to deal with that? Well, they are dealing with that. Uh, they try to, you know, to give people this aid. Of course, it's not enough. I mean, we need around 30,000 um, tons of food per day in order to, all, to get all the people with enough food. So this humanitarian is not, is not enough, but of course it helps to, to the most critical situation. Um, yes, the Red Cross is trying to, to um, yes, uh, at the end I think they are, they are doing their work in a really, you know, uh, um, secret way because they try not to, you know, uh, Try not to go into politics with this situation because the regime, of course, always wants to have a camera and says, okay, this is humanitarian aid, we are giving this, and that's not the, the idea. But at the end, yes, it's important. We need to address the humanitarian crisis. But the thing is that all this uh, aid that is needed at this moment is not enough at the end. And that's a, the, the perspective on this is not to talk, of course, we need to address the situation. We need to help these people, but we cannot see this like the main problem because if we, we see this like the main problem, we always, we will find aid and aid, but not don't, you know, address the real problem that is a defeat of, of the regime because if the regime stays in power, this crisis will continue. So. Yeah, that's that's the main challenge that we have. Um, hello, my name is Luisa Marin, and I work at the OAS 
working group to address the the uh, Venezuelan migrant refugee crisis in the region. Uh, so I have a question, two questions. One, don't you think, okay, after all Guaido's, Guaido has done protests and um, uh, yeah, do, I, I read his Twitters every day and he, he's running out of, of um, I don't know, strategies maybe uh, to, to, to find ways to get rid of the regime. So what's next after that? What else can, he, can be done by him? First and second, uh, I, I was born in Colombia and um, I'm, I'm naturalized here, but I'm from Colombia. And uh, uh, I, know, I know Venezuelans have been used to getting everything subsidized. Don't you think also the solution is to come from the inside, from the, from the, from the people to change this m kind of mentality that they, they need to get empowered yeah. and do things for themselves? Yeah. Because I, I understand that they're used to that and yeah. that's, that's what happens. So yeah, that's, that's a, a point that is related to the role that oil plays in uh, Yes. In, in men, the, not in Venezuela's society, but in Venezuela's mindset that people expect free stuff from the government because the government is rich. It yeah. has a lot of money. What's the position of your political party, of Maria Corina Machado, well, regarding oil in Venezuela? The, the good thing is that the things have changed uh, as a consequence of the crisis. I mean, people have to learn in the worst way possible with the consequence of socialism. Um, I think of course, conscious about the needs that people have on this, this crisis, people really appreciate in this moment, and it's in my experience that I, I travel around all the country uh, permanently with training, you know, in political leadership, and of course, talking people about freedom values and classic liberal things. Um, in my experience, can I, I can say that people um, at this moment is really conscious about the importance of freedom and, and the importance of responsibility and the importance of, you know, the empowerment, but, but also about, you know, that you need to, to, to afford in order to, to get your own things. And that's, that's a, good, a good change. Of course, we need to address this emergency. It's important. Um, but at the same time, uh, I'm optimistic in the way that people uh, learned and understood the importance of, of um, their own, you know, to per pursue their own dreams and their own way to life. So that's important. And in our, in our, in our main work as a political party, we uh, promote freedom every single day. We promote individual freedom. We promote uh, private property. We, we promote free economy. And I think that is the best moment uh, in Venezuela. And even from people that are abroad, that I, I know that most of them are coming back to the country. Uh, is the best moment to talk about this, and of course, against socialism. This is the best moment. Even 20 years after the tragedy, you know, people now uh, uh, now knows how the, how important is freedom. And about your first question about what's next, I have to say that I mean, uh, these talks in Barbados or Oslo, uh, as I said, I don't think that it could be success in 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 the way that they are taking place. Um, and I think that Guaido, at the end, need to pull all the force together, all the, the institutional support, the international support, even the, the, the people support, because I think people believe uh, in, and trust in the leadership of Guaido. But I think he needs to, to go into that path and to get this support in order to push and to create um, a real conditions for a, for a change. But the thing is that it has to be, it has to happen. And at this moment, for that reason, I, I, I think that this dialogue of these processes are distractions, that at the end we are losing time. And the thing is that the time that passed in Venezuela, we are gone this time in lives, lives that, you know, people dying, so, yeah. We're gonna have uh, time only for two more questions. So um, the gentleman over there with the black uh, uh, shirt, yeah, you, and then you. My name is Fernando Catacora. I was born in Peru until my teenager days, until 15 years old. Then I moved to Venezuela. So I follow, and I live in the U.S. Uh, 20 years. I moved from Venezuela to the U.S. right after the Chavez was elected. 
So I think that right, the most important question these days is a question for my respect for you uh, living in Venezuela is that what is missing for, for, for Maduro living, uh, quitting the, 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 the power? Because the, most of the people in Venezuela and maybe uh, most of the countries worldwide, they are the, the most important priority is Maduro leaving the power. What is missing? What, what is really missing in Venezuela regardless of support from other countries but to, to Maduro quit the power? Thank you for your question. Um, as I explained yesterday in a meeting, uh, that's the difference with a traditional dictatorship. Maybe in another context with a normal dictator, uh, probably he left power. The thing is that he's supported by criminal groups, by mafias, and they really don't care about the support from people. I think their only interest is to keep power and to get money, legal or illegal. And of course, they have support of several armed forces, not all of course, but several, at least the leadership of the military. So I think in the moment when we break the mafias and when we break the, the, this criminal dynamic that they have is, is a thing that is missing at this moment. We need to, to break in that way. Um, and I think that's the only possible way to defeat this regime. So it's that, like, the thing is that it's about the nature that they have. Um, if we believe that they will, you know, uh, leave power just because they are with maybe some sanctions or maybe with some um, democratic pressures, it won't be enough because they are criminals. So that's that's my main point on here. Uh, and if we understand that, and, and we afford, we we you know keep all our efforts in in to defeat this criminal dynamic, of course, I think we'll be success. One more final question. Hi, I'm Veronica Mendeville. I'm a student at The Ohio State University. Uh, I have a question. Um, I'd like to circle back on the mentions of uses of force to address this problem. Um, you've mentioned that. It's also been mentioned that there are a lot of different countries that are stakeholders in this issue. You've mentioned Turkey, Israel, Iran, Colombia, Cuba, Brazil. You've also mentioned terrorist groups and um, organized uh, criminal organizations. I'm wondering how you would ensure or what conditions would need to be in place to make sure that any use of force does not escalate into a proxy war, given that a lot of these different groups, um, some of our are at odds with each other and all, all of them have different motives. Oh, thank you for your question. Uh, this is why I explained that when you create a, a, a credible threat, it's not, not just for the regime in place, I mean Maduro or the political groups. Um, it's about their their international partners, like these criminal groups. So the thing is that they are operating freely in Venezuela because they don't feel like you know will happen something that could put in risk their activities. They don't feel the risk, and for that reason, we are you know uh, calling for yes an international coalition in order to create this this threat in order to make these bad guys understand that, okay, we are serious on this, and at the end that um, it's better to leave the country and to, to stop their activities instead of to keep uh, going. So I think about our Western uh, allies, I think they are really conscious about this, and they know the, the activities that they, they do, they know the dynamic, and for that reason, I think it's the moment to create this this um, this uh, credible threat. It's the only way. Um, if not, they will continue. And of course, even for the future of the, of a transition, we need international support because they, if we don't expel these people, these bad guys from our territory, um, we will be. I, I think we could, in this moment, we could uh, be that, but we could be a failure state. And that's a huge problem at the same time. So yeah, I think that's, that's the best approach on that way. Well, thank you very much, Pedro. Let me thank you and uh, please give him a applause for... <laughs>